Kamakura has established itself as a market leader, but tell us a little more about the company. Kamakura was founded by Dr. Don Van Deventer in the late 80s, purely as a market risk organization. Uh, Don uh, very, very quickly realized that um, integrated risk was the way forward and as a matter of fact started to work much before regu regulation and compliance started to creep in into the risk vocabulary. He started to incorporate uh, these risk elements into uh, the Kamakura application fold and in the consulting work that he has uh, enshrined within the organization. And uh, the organization today stands as testimony to the, the work that is done on the integrating of the, the risk solution. So to summarize, what is the core business of Kamakura? Okay, we could probably go off into a long description of the various components that make up risk. But I guess the simple description is Kamakura really is all things risk. To try and separate out credit risk, market risk, liquidity risk and work on them in silos and define them in that manner is actually the incorrect way to address risk. Well risk is the primary concern in most economies at the moment so how does your company approach the subject of understanding risk elements? Okay, our perception of risk hasn't really changed over the last, say, 15 to 20 years. It was 12 years ago I had the pleasure of meeting Don Van Deventer and Adi Tavakol for the first time. And at this point in time I was working with Deutsche Bank. So, like all good, good bankers, we entertained these people, we gave them the coffee and the, the biscuits, and they told us about integrated risk. And Don at this time put up a picture of a flower, and each petal represented a diff ca different category of the risk area, be it credit risk, market risk, operational risk, economic capital management, compliance. And all of these are tied together through the stigma of the flower being the assumptions and the underlying scenarios that go with it. Now being like any good banker at that time, I ignored this information and said, thanks very much, Don, goodbye. So it was 2008 that the world suddenly started to come back together. So the term integrated is something you'll hear from many vendors and many people in the world. But the people who really have been looking at risk under an integrated platform for a very, very long time are these individuals, even before regulators and compliance, it was part of compliance. Let's focus on liquidity risk. Why is that back under the spotlight? I think uh, liquidity has been a forgotten risk. Uh, the amount of uh, focus that has been accorded to other aspects of risk over the last 20 years on one side and liquidity on the other side has been accorded stepmotherly treatment. And then you had the spectacular fallout from the systemic crisis of 2006-2008 resulting in um, crashes here in the UK of Northern Rock, uh, Bradford and Bingley Alliance in Leicester and in the US of Lehman, Merrill Lynch and AIG. And most of these were funneled by other risks but resulted in a liquidity collapses. So liquidity is a second order risk and that's why the regulators have traditionally ignored it. But now they are playing catch up once the horse is bolted from the stable door. I'd actually have to say that liquidity risk from sensible bankers was never out of the spotlight. But obviously because of the situations we're facing at the moment in the markets, we're looking at the EFSF coming up with a package of just been raised to 770 billion euros. Now that's not the end of it. We'll probably be moving towards the 1.5 before we're finished. Now, let's put this in perspective. Italian debt, the third highest in the world, 1.84 trillion. Now we haven't even touched the rest of the euro lands. Morgan Stanley, I think, had an announcement recently saying that they estimated the top 91 European banks with funding requirements of 8 trillion over the next two years. So 47% of that is due within the next 12 months. So liquidity risk is the focus, I guess, of both the regulators and banks at the moment. How would you assess customer creditworthiness through an understanding of macro factor variables? Okay, the question I guess I would have to pose back to you is how would you understand credit worthiness without an assessment of macro factor variables. And this is a fundamental that your grandmother and my grandmother could tell me about. They know that there's an association between certain industries, certain sectors, oil prices, gold prices, uh, exchange rates. This is what's driving us, interest rates. All of these hang together and excluding these and working in these silos is not the way we should be doing it. And this, I guess, leads on to where we're going with credit ratings. So our understanding of credit ratings over the years has obviously changed. We're looking, the world is driven by these 22 categories, be it an S&P or a Moody's of AAA through to single D. 
and it goes off a cliff. So each move, each hiccup, each sneeze in this impacts the markets like nothing unseen. Our approach to this is effectively more of a gradual approach rating from a zero to a hundred in which the world is now moving away from credit ratings and we're coming up with a default probability likelihood for certain institutions. Turning to the banking sector, you might say quo vadis regulator. All the focus is on what the regulatory picture is going to be from here on in. I believe that um, the UK is in the cusp of uh, the single most important political debate with the Vickers Committee uh, right now. And this is going to have far-reaching implications, as will Basel III and its implications on regulation, particularly in the field of capital adequacy. From a Basel III perspective, we're hearing all the terms the liquidity coverage ratio, the LCR. And this kind of takes me back on my journey in life where at this point in time, several years ago, 2008, I would say I became an economic atheist. An economic atheist no longer believing in the information that's being provided to me by the markets. So we're being flooded with information, be it a consumer confidence index, be it a leading indicators index, or be it the German IFO. All of these, is, there's a great deal of information going in that which is just confidence. Now having consumer confidence is one thing, but understanding the underlying numbers is another. And this is kind of where we're coming from. So no more assumptions, let's look at numbers. So my criticism, for instance, of the LCR is, you're taking a numerator, which is about the liquid assets that an institution has available over a 30-day period, dividing that by a set of scenarios provided by the regulator. Now the assumptions, number one, liquid assets. So some of these liquid assets have a, a weighting of 100% being sovereign debt in a domestic currency. Now we've seen from the last weeks, months, that sovereign debt is the issue number one. Then we go into the scenarios on the underlying side here, and these scenarios which were put together under a rigor rigorous routine back in 2010 following the crisis were relevant for Lehman's. We're now looking sovereign. So the scenarios that they put together are no longer relevant for the situation that we're facing today. Suresh Shankaran and Jim Maloney, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hal. It was a pleasure.